All right, folks, we're down to the last week of uh, new information. <clears throat> and actually, this week of new information really is, is for the most part, all review information. So um, not an in terribly intense week, a couple of three chapters to review this week um, to get through the rescue and uh, special operations section um, in the textbook. This is section eight. Uh, for the purpose of the course, we look at this as still part of section seven that will be covered on exam seven um, at the end of this week. <coughs> so um, in this last couple of three chapters is mostly things that have to do with operations, extrication, hazardous materials, and then some disaster response. As with all of our chapters, if you have not read and study the chapter on your own, please do so at your earliest convenience. Simply listening and watching the lecture is no replacement to uh, reading and studying on your own. <coughs> so our education standard for these last three chapters will include uh, the advanced EMT applies knowledge of operational roles and responsibilities to ensure the patient, public, and personnel safety during extra or rescue and vehicle extrication. <coughs> There is a multimedia video on BSI and the objectives that you'll find in the chapter are on 1032 and 1033. <coughs> so as an AEMT, you'll be called to emergency scenes where access to our patients are not readily available. And most of the time when we talk about something like this, we're actually thinking, well, it's a vehicle extrication, it's an auto collision, it's you know, something along those lines. But and that's what we really cover the most probably uh, in this chapter is is vehicle extrication. However, there's always going to be strange and odd situations in which getting to the patient, getting the patient out of the situation is difficult. <clears throat> so while we concentrate mostly in this chapter on vehicles, we also have to consider sometimes even the patient's own house is an issue and we have to do some extrication in that sense. Or even something like, <clears throat> or even something like uh, you know, being trapped in, in uh, some piece of uh, equipment at an uh, industrial setting. So motor vehicle collisions, bodies of water, hazardous atmospheres, uh, terrain. I mean, sometimes we go on a vehicle collision, the person's not really trapped in the, in the vehicle but actually accessing them. It brings to mind a, uh, a call that I had a number of years ago that um, the uh, patient uh, decided that she was going to try to kill herself. And uh, so she put her seatbelt on and drove her car uh, down the road and off the, uh, the highway into a tree. And uh, I, I had to chuckle when we uh, actually got down to the patient. And she was she was crying. And, and, and distraught and upset and, and I asked her I says so what happened she's like I just couldn't take it anymore and I wanted to kill myself and I reached down and pulled on her seatbelt that she was still wearing so um, it, it was it was one of those situations that I was just like you didn't think that one through very well did you but the reason I bring this one up actually is the fact that when she went off of the roadway she went down an embankment um, it wasn't very steep but it was far. So uh, what I'd guesstimate it probably about 300 yards um, off of the roadway. Um, and, it, and it was a fairly, it was a fairly good hill, not terribly steep, but it required us to extricate her out of the vehicle, um, simple, simple extrication of the vehicle. And then we had to place her on the backboard and into a Stokes basket to hike her up the hill, just, just for the fact that this wasn't something that we could easily just and two or three of us huffer up the hill. I mean, it took us and a number of uh, firefighters to, uh, to get her uh, moved up to the roadway. <clears throat> so assisting in rescue operations, such as extrication uh, or disentanglement of patients from wreckage, depending on our role, depending on our agency, is going to dictate how much of that we actually are involved with. In this day and age, EMTs are not trained in extrication. And when I say extrication, I mean tools to cut people out of cars. So if you are in an agency that requires you to do this, you will have to take additional training. Um, 
and, and this has changed over the years because in, in the early years, there's the 70s, um, EMTs were taught a lot of extrication. In fact, when I went through my education um, during what was still referred to as the EMTA curriculum, um, there was there was a significant amount of time and uh, practice spent uh, learning the, the techniques of patient extrication. In this day and age, we simply give you a, a simple um, introduction and then leave it with, this is not the EMT's job. However, if you work in a multi-role setting, it will be your employer's responsibility to, men, to ensure you have additional education. So if you are a uh, EMS-based fire service um, where you know you, you respond with perhaps your dual, dual role or dual trained, um, you're going to have to get additional education uh, through the fire side of things because in, in the EMS side of things, we take care of patients. So, so PPE, BSI, all that good stuff um, it is paramount when we're talking about extrication and, and, and patient access. Um, and that PPE, BSI, is a broad term. Um, BSI is body substance isolation, and that's what we're used to using uh, throughout our emergency medical responses. However, it is also a part of PPE, which is personal protective equipment, a bigger, broader category that protects us from the situation. So to expand upon the the PPE, and that's not to say you're not going to use BSI, because in most cases, I mean, we can see in the picture here, uh, this firefighter has uh, eye protection on, and I would venture to guess that he probably has um, some non-latex gloves underneath his extrication gloves. That seems to be kind of uh, par for the course in many, many departments, is first they'll put on their patient protection, you know, their, their BSI gloves, and then put on their heavier extrication gloves. So um, now with the PPE, in this case, we're seeing things like helmets. Um, why he doesn't have his visor down, I don't know. But uh, that probably would be a smart idea is to have the visor down. Uh, of course, he's got his bunker coat on, his thicker gloves. I'm sure he's got his, his uh, turnout boots as well. Um, and all of those are, are pretty standard. Now, depending on the situation, um, some some departments have um, modified bunkers, basically, um, that are extrication jumpsuits, more or less, uh, that are maybe a little bit more room uh, roomy and, and uh, friendly when it comes to trying to uh, to do things. <clears throat> so now, with that being said, talking about things like helmets, um, I envision the day probably not far away in which EMS providers are going to wear helmets on all calls, particularly while in transport. Um, there's one thing that they've identified as they've started to review what are the safety standards, what are the construction standards uh, that ambulances should have. The next generation of ambulance that you guys are going to see come around is going to look vastly different uh, than uh, the way it currently does now. Uh, the bench seat is probably dead. Uh, we're probably not going to have bench seats anymore. Uh, it's simply for the fact that we can't adequately take care of two patients at one time. Uh, in most crew configurations, we don't even have the appropriate hands to do that. Now, there may be some, uh, there may be some uh, <clears throat> backup mechanisms in place um, where you might be able to, to uh, change out a seat or something like that. But in most cases, we're going to see a, a uh, a, basically a captain's chair um, or a, a bucket seat placed currently in the place that the uh, uh, squad bench is right now. And it most likely will be forward facing. Now it will swivel so you can turn and take care of your patient, but also have off to the front of you um, your computer for uh, appropriate uh, documentation and whatnot. Um, they're going to change the way that some of the cabinetry and stuff in the ambulances uh, is uh, is structured. <clears throat> we might see things such as nets with various pouches uh, installed on these nets um, that are getting uh, kind of going to be your high high common or your very common uh, equipment uh, that's going to be within reach. 
there's been some discussion on whether or not there should be harness systems, five-point harnesses that more or less uh, <coughs> suspend from the ceiling to uh, <coughs> give ad added uh, crash protection. There's going to be a lot more latchable cabinets <coughs> because there's too much stuff flying around in ambulances. I've been in a handful of ambulance crashes in my career, um, <coughs> and uh, each time I can say, for sure, other than ones that were at you know two or three miles an hour in a parking lot, um, a cardiac monitor went flying. You know, not to mention, uh, you know, the expense of that that piece of equipment, which is, you know, at the paramedic level, a, a cardiac monitor defibrillator is, is these days a thirty or forty thousand dollar piece of equipment. Uh, but how heavy they are these days too, um, and it's a wonder that more people aren't injured or killed by those. So things will be vastly different. They're still working on the final guidelines. They've stolen some stuff from Europe and what Europe is doing. In fact, I think a lot of um, Europe's influence has already been seen. We're starting to see the alternating colored reflective chevrons on the back of most of our emergency vehicles these days. Uh, and that was stolen from Europe. So um, we're going to see some, some interesting changes. Um, Besides helmets, uh, we're also going to consider things eye protection. There are some systems and some services that require their employees to wear their safety goggles at all times when in the presence of a patient. Love it or hate it, um, it certainly is going to reduce the probability of somebody getting uh, substances in their eyes. And uh, it's just really becoming the, the standard. Um, video talk a little bit more about BSI. Okay, And hearing and ear protection. Many services also are uh, at least stocking on the on the trucks uh, hearing protection. Uh, I can tell you without a doubt that nearly a quarter of a century working in this field that the siren has taken its toll on my hearing. I didn't have great hearing to begin with. Uh, but uh, the more and more that I've been around sirens and and uh, you know uh, revving up uh, generators that run the uh, uh, the Hearst tools or the hydraulic tools, you know diesel engines and all so on and so forth, um, it's taken its toll. So some different hearing protection, um, whether or not they are are using many of many of the uh, city fire departments uh, are installing. Uh, headsets that everybody wears that protects their hearing yet allows them to have um, some uh, conversation while en route to a call and then they may have earplugs or you know, various different other hearing protection available to them. Hand protection, leather gloves, um, if we're going to be doing any crawling in and out of vehicles, um, working in a, in a situation that has increased cut hazards, we've got to have some, some leather gloves. Most departments, I think, have a good enough relationship. I'm not going to say all of them, but most departments probably have a good enough relationship that EMS could probably talk with uh, their fire or their extrication um, counterpart and say, hey, when you guys are ready to uh, swap, swap out equipment, you know, you, you upgrade everybody's uh, bunker gear or everybody's helmets or what have you <laughs> to the next level, um, you know, their leather gloves and whatnot, keep us in mind because we would like to have your hand-me-downs um, because it gives you, a, a, it gives you a, a sense of, or not a sense, but it gives you a, a, a layer of protection <laughs> for crawling in and out of the back windows while they're flapping the roof and cutting doors off and whatnot. Um, you don't need probably the most advanced and uh, the latest and greatest. Um, you simply need something to help protect you. So um, that's something to consider. Foot precaution, um, depending on the situation, uh, you may have um, steel shanked boots that you're wearing. Um, you may have steel toed boots as well to give you some, some extra protection. Um, we recommend, I think uh, most people that work in uh, this field on a on a full time basis probably wear some sort of a boot to begin with just as an extra added um, support but uh, consider that um, oh yeah this slide talks about 
wearing your medical gloves beneath your leather protective gloves. The leather doesn't protect you from the blood and body fluids, so that's why you do that. <coughs> Additional body protection, so turn out extrication jumpsuits. Um, all kind of depends on, on the situation that your department is in. Um, so I know a lot of dual role departments, uh, people that are assigned to the, the ambulance, um, when they come off of the fire truck, perhaps, they will take their bunker gear and stow it in one of the side compartments of the ambulance should they need it. So uh, uh, that's a possibility. Other, other miscellany, personal flotation devices, what is uh, often called uh, life vests. Um, but PFDs, uh, certainly something to consider if you're involved with water rescues, whether you're on a, on a boat or you're even doing something such as ice rescue. Um, I, I think that we have to, to also stop here and, and think about all the what others. Um, whether or not you're in, in a particular cold environment, you perhaps are going to need something different. Um, you know, heavier coats and, and appropriate gloves and, and hats and whatnot. Um, you know, it depends so much on everybody's situation that they're in. Things to consider for patient safety. Uh, if we're talking about going out on these scenes in which patients are potentially going to be extricated or rescued, um, things to keep in mind, wool blankets, tarps, helmets, hearing protection, goggles, dust masks, shielding. Um, because when the patient's in the car trapped and we're cutting on that car to try to get that person out, um, they're just at, as much at risk. Uh, as, as the people on the outside cutting or yourself being on the inside um, taking care of that patient. So we have to, to take those measures. Um, and it's very scary for those patients while they're inside. Perhaps we cover them with a blanket or we cover them with you know, a tarp. Um, you, that's why you have to continue to, to talk with your patient and let them know what's going on. So don't forget those things. I mean, if it's possible for us to put a helmet on, put a uh, some hearing protection on them, great, um, but you have to consider what the situation is. I think most uh, most services are pretty good about grabbing a blanket or grabbing a tarp, um, but we do we need to take it further? We, we possibly do. The dangerous areas, I mean, uh, I remember going on an extrication once uh, as, as a paramedic and I didn't have any responsibility doing any cutting, and I've done that. I've, I've, I've been trained in extrication using the tools and whatnot, but um, in my role, most of the time, of course, I was in, in a medical front. So the uh, I remember going on a call once, and uh, fire had cut the roof off of this car and thrown it off into the to the grass, and it was start, starting to get kind of dark out. And uh, I'm walking down uh, towards the car, didn't see these uh, this cut post coming up out of the, the grass there, and, and it caught me on the leg and cut my leg. So um, <clears throat> those are, it's dangerous. I mean, glass and, and uh, hot fluids and potential for fire hazards and all that. So, goes with your case study. Okay, so rescue is always performed by trained individuals. So do not attempt to perform the tasks you are not qualified to perform. Nowhere in this, in this class have you been taught anything about how to use a hydraulic tool? Not, we, we're not going to tell you, teach you about um, the specifics of how to take off a, a roof, or how to how to pop a door. Um, we're going to tell you about some of the hazards, but that's really just more of an, of an information thing. So <clears throat> teamwork is a must. Um, in the best calls that I've gone on that have required rescue um, have been ones in which I can walk, pull up on the scene, as generally the paramedic in charge, walk over to the fire officer in charge, and potentially the law enforcement officer in charge, if, if you know that's the case, um, and say, okay, here's the situation, here's how we've assessed it, this is how, there, here are our concerns from a medical standpoint. You know, I, I have never been one that's you know, going to jump and tell them, hey, I need you guys to know, cut this, this car, uh, you know, cut the roof off this way or take the door off that way. Um, I'm simply, this is my patient priority. This is who I need out. 
make it happen. <clears throat> so, um, and it's important for each individual to know his or her specific tasks. So it, it kind of depends. When I spent uh, you know, a number of years um, working out as a volunteer firefighter uh, on, on top of my my duties as a as a career paramedic. Um, <clears throat> You know, it depended on which truck you jumped on as, as that truck went out the door as to what was going to be your role, at least initially. Of course, things change over the course of, a, of an incident, but uh, knowing what your role is, whether you're going to be in, in an extrication role, whether you're going to be in a, you know, a standing by with suppression, so a, a charged hose line or whatnot. So knowing what you're supposed to do. So if you come on an ambulance, most situations, most services, you show up on an ambulance, you are responsible for taking care of the patient, period. So in a rescue operation, we have a couple of different phases. Phase one is arrival and scene size up. This really shouldn't be shocking uh, to any of us because this is very similar to how we handle it in EMS as well. So we're assuring that the scene is safe for us to approach. And if you're responding in a... <clears throat> Um, if you're responding in a role um, as a uh, fire suppression person, uh, that's a very, very good potential that you're going to be one of those that is making the scene safe, um, provided that, uh, you know, we're not talking about people that are, you know, potentially dangerous f folks running around um, that law enforcement need to take care of. It's perhaps you know a, a uh, anhydrous ammonia tank is leaking. That's going to be part of your role uh, is to take care of that. So, um, identifying the number of patients and looking for any additional resources needed. You know, fire I think learns learns this very similar to the way we do. They're looking at hey, we have to call early, and if we don't call early, um, our resources are going to take longer to get to us. So we notify dispatch of any findings. You're arriving in a fire um, mode, perhaps the, the senior person on the truck is going to be establishing um, incident command. <clears throat> in phase two, we're now looking at hazard control. So as we've arrived on scene, we've looked, you know, where do we have got cars at? Where do we have power lines down at? Where do we have poles that are broken? Do we have a broken fence um, for, a, uh, <coughs> for a pasture with livestock in it? Um, you know, do we are we you know on the scene of a of a racetrack? Do, what sort of um, fuels are these these cars running? Are they running you know some standard um, you know or some higher octane gasolines, or are we running more the the alcohol? You know, that's going to be looking at those hazards and trying to to, to take a, a, a proactive approach. So we're scanning, we're looking, we're going to try to steer clear of dangers and keep others away. Sometimes in EMS, um, we're standing back because we can't get to the patient, and, that, and that's fine. Um, the environment itself can pose a risk to safety. You know, I, I know a number of times I was out on, on scenes of, of vehicle collisions in which this, the, the collision itself and the patient's condition themselves wasn't necessarily life-threatening. However, from the standpoint of how ugly the environment was with you know it already being 10 degrees below zero and 30 or 40 minus 30 minus 40 mile an hour wind chills um, out in the middle of a country on the top of a hill um, you had to uh, to change your perspective of that scene very quickly knowing that this is not healthy for any of us to be out here <laughs> so looking at the environment slick roads um, uh, I, I, another one that comes to mind uh, responded to a, uh, a car versus semi collision. Car ran into the fuel tank on the side of the semi. Um, it was an you know an instant uh, that the car was just instantly annihilated. The the semi truck was uh, instantly on fire, and uh, the person in the car was uh, essentially blown to bits, and uh, the truck driver. And the semi burned to death uh, alive. So, uh, but I remember <clears throat> some of the most vague or some of the most uh, vivid things in my mind was a, trying to approach that scene because it was in the fall, 
and it was cold where it was getting down below freezing at night, but still fairly decent during the day. And uh, um, it was cold that morning, and the diesel fuel mixed with the water from the fire trucks um, was just making the, the whole roadway a ice skating rink. So it was one of those things that we had to you know, definitely keep in mind uh, that we were going to have to take a different route. So <clears throat> resources necessary for potential hazards. Fire, of course, we need fire suppression. Um, entrap patients and extrication team. This all depends on the situation. Um, there, are, there, are, there are places in which extrication is a completely different unit from fire and from EMS. I do know a few places in which extrication is a role of EMS. So the provide, EMS providers um, are responsible for doing the extrication, uh, carrying the hydraulic tools on the ambulance. I don't agree with it, but um, uh, sometimes that's the way it is. Uh, I know places in which actually extrication is a function of law enforcement, so it all kind of depends. Chemical release and hazmat teams, so that may be a, a separate unit within the fire division, uh, or it could be yet a, a whole other department. Um, you know, there, are, and then it also depends on what that hazmat teams level of operations are. So just because a department has a hazmat team doesn't mean that they're the ones that are going to do the cleanup. Um, it depends on how far they're trained. So they may come out, they may do nothing more than, than stop it from spreading um, and do some decontamination. They, they may be involved in, in the cleanup. Um, they may, may not be. So uh, it all depends on how far a, a department is trained. Dangerous individuals, law enforcement, dangerous animals, considering animal control or law enforcement, um, power lines, gas leaks, water leaks, so on and so forth. The various utility companies may need to be contacted. Um, you know, sometimes uh, we <coughs> sometimes we also have to take into consideration: Do we need to maybe get a uh, a tow truck out here? Sometimes the way that vehicles are crashed, um, you know, you need the specifics of the booms on a tow vehicle uh, to uh, roll a car over, or move a car. Um, sometimes we've also had to get uh, um, agricultural equipment involved. So sometimes you're going to be calling people like you might call, I know particularly during planting and harvest season, um, most uh, implement dealers have somebody as their on-call person for the implement dealer 24 hours a day. So if you would have an incident in which somebody's entrapped in, um, you know, we'll say a, a combine, um, you could get a hold of them. Uh, usually it's a mechanic, of course, that has a, a very good working knowledge of how that piece of equipment works, and they can come out and help you um, remove the equipment from around your patient. <coughs> Phase three becomes patient access. So once it's safe to access the patient, determine the safest possible way to do so while ensuring your own safety. Be alert for hazards. Okay, sometimes hazards continue to crop up. This isn't something we had to think about as much when um, I started my career, but we have so many different airbags in vehicles these days. Um, some of which are you know only deploy in specific settings and specific situations. But you get in there prying on stuff and cutting on stuff, and sometimes you can find yourself in a world of hurt real quick. So knowing what the potential hazards are. Um, so you most likely are going to be directed to stand by and assess and treat patients as they get removed um, from by the, uh, the extrication people or the rescue professionals. Phase four is medical treatment. This is really our forte. This is where we're at. Doing the assessment, initiating the treatment, continuing treatment throughout transport, reassessing. Um, when potential for spinal injury exists, immediately manually stabilize the head and neck and maintain cervical spine alignment. So at least that continues to be our, our primary um, 
concern really in many vehicle accidents. Um, now, as, as time goes on, and I've been seeing more and more articles in which there are more and more departments that are now saying no more backboards. And uh, um, that's definitely probably going to be a, a big change. It's going to be a paradigm shift in EMS. Um, but uh, you know, we'll, we'll see what the future brings on some of these uh, different uh, changes to actually moving patients. <clears throat> Additionally, our primary assessments treat life threats as they're identified. Nowhere does it say you can't treat a patient before you can get them out. So if this is going to take 10, 15, 20 minutes to get a patient cut loose, um, there's no reason why somebody can't get in the car and take some vital signs, do some basic assessments on them, maybe start an IV or two. I've done that several times in my career. Started IVs while sitting in a car with a patient waiting for this patient to get cut out. You know, airway management. I know of people who have had to, to put in advanced airways while the patient's still sitting upright in their seat. Um, don't know that I've had to do that one. But, um, you know, so there's all kinds of things we can be doing while uh, simultaneous with other actions going on here, provided that we have the, the way to do it safely. So, of course, continuing to remain calm, be reassuring, be professional. You know, tourniquets. Uh, tourniquets, uh, have, as, as strongly as those have come back these days, um, taking tourniquets with you into the car. It's a very, very good possibility you're going to need it. So, disentanglement. Disentanglement, this is the act of freeing the patient from the entrapment. This is where a lot of technical skill is going to be required to do this effectively and safely. Um, <clears throat> as, as things change over time, I mean, when I started my career, uh, not even a, there were not a lot of departments that even really had the jaws of life. They didn't have uh, the power uh, hydraulic tools. They had hand-powered electronic tools, in which uh, were things uh, called porta powers, where they were doing some hand pumping um, <clears throat> of various devices to spread and cut and whatnot. There were still a lot of hack saws, uh, windshield saws, um, big uh, uh, mallets and hammers, uh, crowbars, chisels, uh, even some big ugly looking things that we called can openers. And that's exactly what they were. They were a giant manual can opener uh, that basically had a, 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 sl a slide hammer on it that you could cut through the, the metal of the vehicle. So having the technical skill and knowing what, what is available to, in a specific area, whether they have airbags, they have rams, they have spreaders and cutters, um, plasma cutters, all kinds of different um, interesting tools out there. Everybody that's on that service, of course, needs to be very well rehearsed in that. Um, I strongly recommend uh, departments that are, are separate to work together. So if the extrication team is going to work on cutting open cars, what a great opportunity for EMS to participate in their drill and to do some of the patient care aspects during that drill. Um, and perhaps it's even a good time for the extrication people to get a little exposure to what we're doing as providers and for us to get a little exposure is what they're doing as rescue technicians. All right. Depending on the situation, you may be in the vehicle with the person. You may be standing by. You may be just sitting there waiting to go as soon as they get this patient um, uh, freed. So you may enter the space with the patient and, and initiate treatment there. Somebody's trapped in a, um, somebody has a compression injury which their lower extremities uh, and their pelvis are perhaps being compressed. Uh, a vehicle's fallen on them, they're trapped in a machine, what have you. By gosh, you should be in there treating them before they go and decide to, to go take this excessive amount of weight off of them. Um, getting that, uh, getting a couple IVs going, considering whether your service uses mass pants or PASG. Uh, having a high flow O2 on them, covering them up, keeping them warm, you know, having everything ready to go. Um, so as soon as you get that weight lifted off them, you're ready to, to do uh, 
uh, swift shock management because there's a very good chance that they're going to become instantly hypotensive. So, of course, PPE, protect your patient. Packaging, considering how we're going to move the patient. Sometimes it takes more than what we have. Um, if we have our backboards, maybe we have a soft stretcher, or we have a Reeves sleeve, or um, maybe we're going to use a, a KED or whatever. Those are all great. However, <coughs> like I mentioned with my situation, which he had launched a car off about 300 yards off of the embankment, um, the use of a Stokes basket. Uh, was much better a much better option because we had better handles to hold on to. It was easier to control her. Um, I once had a, uh, an electrician get electrocuted on the roof of a high school um, and was in cardiac arrest. There was no way that with the equipment in my ambulance we were getting him off the roof of that high school. Um, so it required an aerial ladder fire truck and another Stokes basket, very special rigging in order to get him uh, off the roof. So. Uh, that patient packaging can be very different looking. Um, if you have, um, if you're using some of these equipment, remember sometimes it's temporary. So if you're using something like a, a Stokes basket, I wouldn't recommend you take the Stokes basket in the ambulance with you. It's usually bigger than your cot is. So the Stokes basket may be used to get them from point A to point B, and at point B being the, where the ambulance was parked, you'll lift the backboard out of the Stokes basket, put it on the stretcher, and away you go. Phase seven is removal and transport. <clears throat> so, um, removal of the patient from the scene is often difficult after he's freed, and that's what I mentioned with things like Stokes baskets and aerial fire trucks and whatnot. You know, again, another situation I had, I had a guy who had a back spasm while re-roofing his house. Um, you know, again, it required an aerial ladder fire truck and a Stokes basket. Um, however, had we not had an aerial ladder fire truck, we would have had to consider uh, alternatives you know, with ground ladders and, and pulleys and whatnot. So, um, perhaps if it's a very specific uh, confined space rescue, you might have different tripods with different um, sleeves and, and uh, pulley settings that, that are working to um, uh, assist you in moving that patient out of that confined space. Um, Choose the method to move the patient that offers the least risk to your own safety, as well as the safety of other rescuers and patients. So that's why putting them in that Stokes basket where you have easy handle holds to move them um, is usually better than trying to reach underneath them, trying to hold on to these little holes in the backboard and moving them up and out. Initiate transport to an appropriate facility based on their clinical condition. In most cases, if we're talking about a rescue situation, we're probably talking about a trauma. If we're talking a trauma, um, you know, whenever possible, we're transporting to the most appropriate facility and, and uh, spending as little time on scene as possible. Ensure you have enough resources to safely get the patient over rough terrain. All right, so you'll be called to MVCs where disentanglement will take a prolonged period of time due to the complexity, complexity of the wreckage. Initiate your treatment as soon as practical and prepare to transport the patient as soon as possible, considering aeromedical transport. <laughs> you know, I, I, I've kind of been rough on the helicopter services um, because um, we know in reality where everybody thinks, um, oh, they're so great and they're all so wonderful, um, they're expensive when they crash, they don't walk away from them, um, and they rarely do more than a ground ambulance does unless we're talking you know, a BLS transport service versus, you know, you're almost always going to get ALS in a helicopter. So, um, but when we're talking about people who are trapped, that definitely is a bonus when it comes to air medical transport because the helicopter can be on scene a lot of times before the patient's even extricated. That's where the true time saving is is when we can't immediately begin ground transport from the get-go. So when we can't immediately get a start ground transport, uh, involving aeromedical transport is definitely going to save us some time. <coughs> Water rescue. Um, there are various teams, uh, I know particularly in southwest Iowa, 
uh, that deal with water rescue. And there's different types of water rescue. You may be talking something like a swift water rescue, in which we're talking heavy currents. Um, maybe we're talking about water recovery teams, um, where we have people that perhaps have gone under, so we need a dive team. So a dive team is different than a swift water rescue. They may work together. They may work separately. So um, the uh, um, situation that you're in, the system that you're in, you're going to need to know what are your immediate immediate resources. Now, I remember going on a drowning a number of years ago and uh, having teams come from, um, it actually ended up being a, not a drowning, it ended up being a water recovery, body recovery. Um, you did die of drowning. but. Um, having teams come from 90, 90 to 120 minutes away uh, to come try to assist uh, in the recovery of, of this uh, decedent. So uh, it all kind of depends. Sometimes you've got them close by, sometimes it's going to be a little bit of a wait. So. <clears throat> all right. Mountains, uh, that would be perhaps where we're looking at swift water, where we get heavy rains, we get flooding. Um, water becomes dangerous um, by increases in water flow. So do not underestimate the strength of water current. Um, I was working in uh, Crawford County um, in 1996 when we had a couple of uh, floods that uh, affected the Booyah River that uh, flows, actually two different forks of it flow through uh, Crawford County. And uh, um, we had some, some pretty... Uh, hairy situations a couple times. It wasn't the worst flooding that they had had, but it was pretty close. Uh, 1993, flooding was much worse there, but um, of course it was bad along the Missouri River during 93 as well. Um, I didn't have anything to do with the, I guess it would have been 2011 or 12 floods but, um, along the Missouri, but um, so the strength of water and how people sometimes lose their freaking minds and drive into standing water. But uh, we had a couple situations in which it was, it was fairly touchy uh, that we thought we were going to lose a vehicle uh, due to the uh, strength of the water flow. All right. <clears throat> Do not enter the water to access a patient unless you've been specially trained in water rescue and you have the appropriate equipment. Um, this is not something that's, that's easy to do. Um, a lot of times it, it's a it's a slower paced rescue than many people would think it would be because so they would think that people well we need to get in there get it you know get this moving and, and get them out of there and a lot of times again remember we're looking at the safety of the rescuers first so individuals may be stranded in the water but not at risk a um, couple of times I, I dealt with this in which People had driven into into some water, um, but yet the water wasn't up nearly high enough on their vehicle that it was an immediate life threat. Um, so we were able to get out there in boats and whatnot, and in, in due time get them removed to safety. So um, <clears throat> sometimes they may be in immediate danger; they may get washed away. It could be a swift water rescue. Um, some other things to consider, water temperature, remember cold water is going to be better, um, if there's cold water rescue, uh, there's a chance of hypothermia, however, we know that most people that suffer from a mild hypothermia actually end up being uh, doing uh, fairly well. Now, that can very quickly go, um, go to too cold, um, but, uh, and then of course the, the length of time that they're down is going to be, be huge. Moving water. Um, swift water rescue, um, it, these people are specially trained in trying how to basically catch people um, and uh, get them from um, any quickly moving waters. And then debris, a lot of times it's not specifically the water that's an issue, it's what's flowing in the water. Is it logs? Is it other, you know, uh, general junk uh, that's been picked up in the process of this flooding um, and it's going to... Uh, potentially take out a person, you know, whether you've got tires floating around or, or what have you. So, so sometimes they may also become pinned. 
they could become entrapped basically <clears throat> based off of the crap that's in the water. The patient in calm water, try to throw a flotation device with the line attached to it. Um, or if you can reach them, if they're not too far out, try to reach out with a pole. Um, <coughs> similar to that of, you know, that you'd see maybe in a swimming pool um, where they have these reach poles. Um, so try to reach out maybe with a, from a, you know, to, to bring up a, a piece of fire equipment, a, a pike pole. Um, so a very long pole with a hook on it. So you might be able to reach them. Throw them a line. Throw them a flotation bag. Um, those sorts of things. Uh, patients in the water um, may be in a state of panic. They can grab onto you or even pull you under the water. The most dangerous thing you can do to try to go and rescue a person is actually go and swimming out there to them yourselves. Um, the, there's a, a very good probability that uh, the person uh, is going to freak out because they're going to do everything they can to keep themselves above water, including if that means trying to climb on top of your head. <laughs> Hazardous atmospheres, confined space. Uh, when we're talking confined space, collapses, perhaps even industrial settings or farm settings. Uh, we may be talking about oxygen deficient spaces. Uh, there's a lot of different hazardous gases um, that we may run into. Um, so if we're running into those hazardous gases, of course entering uh, without any appropriate protective equipment such as a, an SCBA um, puts us uh, at nearly an immediate risk to become a patient ourselves. So don't enter the space. Do not allow others to enter it. And call for assistance. So if you're responding to a, a silo or a, a grain bin or a, a specific um, industrial setting uh, where you're talking about at least one person is down, multiple people are down. Um, I heard one, um, well, it's been a couple of years I guess now, in which a couple guys went into a tank car uh, of a train um, and uh, there had been some chemical in this tank car and they had gone in there to do some work or fix it or something like that and one person went down so second person decided to go in to try to help them and they went down and, and it ended up taking three lives. Uh, by the time that uh, they finally said, um, that must be a hazardous situation in there. We should probably not go in. So as much as people want to play the hero, um, sometimes it's going to be the end. Remember, dead and injured EMTs don't do anyone any good. Storage tanks, transport containers, silos, manholes, cisterns, mines, um, the chance of a toxic or even an explosive material, um, the rich, uh, and rich, uh, risk of engulfment um, or catching on fire, uh, and or electricity. You know, going down in manholes, a lot of times that involves um, electrical lines down there. Um, so, again, if this is not something that you're very familiar with, uh, and, and I can say I, I was kind of lucky in, in uh, the years that I was a volunteer firefighter, um, we had a number of people on our department that worked in a variety of capacities with our various utilities. So we had some people who worked with electricity and some people who were familiar with gas and whatnot. So we were very lucky in many cases in which uh, we had experts that were also responding. <laughs> Vehicle extrication, again, must be, high, must be trained. Um, and this is really not something that you go to fire training one night and, you know, four hours later you're an expert in extrication. Um, this really takes, this, there, there's a lot of, uh, a lot of technique, a lot of learning, and not to mention so much variation in different types of vehicles these days. When if we're talking, you know, somebody in a 1979 Ford LTD, which you could land airplanes on, uh, or if we're talking about, you know, today somebody's driving around in a, in a Prius, um, you know, completely different vehicles, um, completely different concepts of construction. You know, you had this ginormous battleship of a vehicle uh, from 1979 uh, that was safe simply for the fact that it was heavy and it was made out of so much steel and, you know, and it was enormous. You had a nice barrier around you. 
whereas something like you know a Prius today, people think, oh, you know, it's it's not very very safe. Well, it, it's really not as, as unsafe as many people think, because technology has altered the way that some of these materials uh, work, and vehicles are made to crumple differently, and the engine is intended to drop out of the bottom, so it doesn't land in your lap. So things, technology has made things different. So to simply, you know, go to one or two nights of, of extrication training on how to use these tools is not nearly enough. So. Um, scene size up. The windshield survey uh, plus an on-scene briefing will assist you in making decisions about what medical equipment will be needed and how extrication will need to proceed. So a lot of times we may jump out with say our, uh, you know, maybe our, our trauma bag or our jump bag We'll probably grab some seat collars and a backboard, but as we actually approach the patient, we see, we take a good look at the car, and that's important to do that. That's mechanism of injury. Look at the car, okay? Do we have bent steering wheels? Do we have parts and pieces that are broken off? Do we have intrusion? Do we have starred windshields? All of this. So we may get to the car, we may talk to the patient or look at the patient and decide, oh, we need to completely... Uh, go from a different angle here. Uh, what additional resources should be considered? Hopefully, fire suppression um, and extrication are already on scene. <clears throat> Perhaps you considered putting a helicopter on standby on the way out because of what the information were, you were given and you arrive on scene and come to find out uh, this isn't as bad after all as I thought it was going to be. So um, it ends up being, you know, maybe we should, maybe we should, uh, maybe we should get rid of the uh, or call off the helicopter. Um, those are all potentials. Um, whether or not you need further heavy rescue, maybe you need um, a second ambulance, a third ambulance, whatever. <clears throat> so the exterior condition of the automobile helps provide us clues. It helps us know how much energy did we have involved here. You know, are we seeing seeing things that make us go, ooh, man, I don't know how anybody could survive that. Well, that's probably a pretty good indication there's a lot of energy involved there. You know, sometimes also we show up on these vehicle crashes that you don't see much on the outside, and you're like, huh, but come to find out after we do some assessment, it's actually worse than we originally thought. <coughs> Make note of damage to the vehicle. Look at things like door posts, quarter panels, kick panels, and fenders, uh, rocker panels. Rocker panels the um, underneath the door. Okay, so have those things been moved, or do some of those things? I mean, a lot of times, car crashes can look fairly bad because the sheet metal on the outside is bent up. But looking at the things that are more structural, uh, if we're talking things such as, you know, door posts, the, the frame of the vehicle and whatnot, that helps give us a, a truly a better idea of how much energy was actually transferred into the <coughs> patient compartment of the vehicle. Um, provide optimum care for the injured person to the best that you can, okay? You're going to have to communicate between yourself and the extrication officer, like I mentioned. Tell them, hey, I don't really care how you get this person out, but this is the one I need out. Be direct about how you wish extrication to proceed. So it pauses that patient's condition dictates. Perhaps you start out the patient's doing fine. So, um, but partway through this extrication process, the patient's condition changes, and maybe they now have become a higher priority than the other patient that's in the vehicle. Um, you may need to interrupt treatment during an attempt to free the patient uh, and then restart it. So if you try to get the patient out, you try to do a rapid extrication. Uh, and once they're fully extricated, our, our concern is on packaging, treatment, transport, assessment. So mechanism of injury plays an important part in rapid assessments, treatments, and transport. Speed and choice of appropriate care facilities are also of the essence. So when we're stopping to say, okay, what do we have here? 
um, how quickly do we need to move down the road, and what exactly, <coughs> what exactly is this patient going to need uh, in the long run? Removal of a, multi, uh, of a motor vehicle collision victim uh, is a critical function of the fire and rescue and ambulance services. Of course, we continue to focus on our patient care. We're going to gain access to the patient after controlling the hazards. Proper stabilization of the vehicle is critical. Probably a good thing to, to remind you that there are times in which we show up on a vehicle collision in which, um, yeah, the vehicle is, is on all fours, but it may not be stable on all fours. Maybe it's, it's, it's slanted. Maybe it's, it's tipping. Um, of course, I've been on many cases in which it's been rollover situations. In fact, I had a T-bone collision once between a pickup truck and a straight truck in which the pickup truck ended up upside down with the straight truck on top of it. Um, and in that situation, um, it really uh, it became a very nerve-wracking situation simply for the fact that um, we, we had done a lot to try to shore things up and stabilize things up, but, I mean, it was just that constant thought of, wow, that's a lot of weight that could shift so easily. <clears throat> so gain access for a patient after controlling the hazards. Uh, ensure everyone understands the plan for extrication and treatment. Everybody needs to be on the same sheet of music. Now, if you have multiple patients, um, somebody probably needs to be acting in the the uh, the incident commander, the medical incident commander here, and kind of coordinating efforts here. Who's going to take which patient? Which patient's going to what facility? Um, you know, you may be stuck in a situation which you have only one facility to transport them, and if that's the case, then that's the case. But uh, if you have a uh, <coughs> the option to send people to different places. Um, it, somebody's going to need to coordinate those things. Um, access can be gained by the provider using whatever means necessary. Don't, uh, one thing I, I need to mention here is use the KISS method. Um, keep it simple, stupid. Um, don't think you have to be busting windows out and don't start ripping doors off when it might be something simple as walking to the other side of the car where the door is unlocked and not jammed, and you open the door and you get in with the patient. You know, instead of breaking out windshields and whatnot, um, keep it simple. Take a moment and look at it. Show, if you show up, the patient's trapped in the car but conscious, you might need to tell them, hey, unlock the door. Um, sometimes it's just that simple to get to our patients. So we need to keep that always in mind. Um, take our patients out. I mean, don't don't make it an overly complicated thing to get our patients. Um, sometimes people are thinking, oh, well, I can't get this patient out. I'm going to have to rip this. We're going to have to have this door sprung by the, the hydraulic tool. Um, no. In most cases, two guys with a little bit of, of pressure can easily spring a door. Um, and you can push that door back so it's, you know, up closer to the fender of the car. So you don't have to rip things apart. Uh, when sometimes just a little ingenuity or a little common sense is all you really need. So the patient's condition and extent of the entanglement needs to be relayed to the officers. So sometimes it's a step-by-step -step process. You may think, well, the patient's trapped by this, that, and the other thing, and they start doing a little pry, and they start doing a little cut, and they start doing a little spread, and, and next thing you know, it's like, oh, well, that's not, in fact, what was keeping them trapped in here. So let's change gears because now we have to go this route because this is what we now believe is the problem. So all involved have to be aware of that big picture. And you will make the final decisions regarding how extrication um, will proceed from the medical standpoint. Remember, they can, patients can change uh, condition very quickly. Patient care during extrication still follows the same protocols as within normal situations. We just simply have to sometimes be creative in the way we do it. You know, I know of, of a paramedic that had to intubate a patient um, but couldn't, couldn't actually get over the top of them to look down their throat with a laryngoscope to intubate them. So he used the rear view mirror 
that was still on the windshield of the car to help him see where he was going with his um, uh, endotracheal tube. So using some ingenuity, you just have to alter the situation. People who need black and white situations don't function well here. So um, <clears throat> online medical direction may be required. Sometimes maybe medical direction is going to have to send somebody out. There have been times which people have been so badly trapped in which an, an, an amputation was, was going to become necessary. And if that's the situation, um, you get on the phone with medical control and say, here's the sitch. I don't know that we're going to be able to get this patient out. How can, you know, can you send somebody out to assist us? Um, and, uh, you know, they send, send a surgeon out maybe with some, uh, some rudimentary tools and, and uh, cut off an arm or a leg. Um, it's very common for us to have extended care issues, uh, particularly with heavy vehicle extrication. Um, sometimes patients are very easy to get out, and they're not the ones that need the most help. <coughs> In those situations, you know, move them along as you can. Um, have the appropriate resources stay behind to care for the, 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 the worst situation. So establish rapport early, both with your patient and your fellow rescuer. Airbag deployment, definitely something that has to be kept in mind. Um, accidental activation of the airbags can occur. It can injure you. It can injure your patient. It is, can be extremely, extremely dangerous. Those airbags deploy at a ridiculous speed and force. Um, if you ever get an opportunity to see them uh, discharge some, some airbags, um, definitely go see it. Um, it's, uh, it's impressive. So. Deactivation can be essential for safe extrication. This is something that kind of changes over time as well. Um, it used to be that we were, you know, you, you, you cut the battery cable. Well, come to find out they hold a charge, so just simply cutting the battery cable maybe wasn't enough. So it was cut the battery cable, ground it out to the frame to try to, you know, zip down any leftover uh, charge that was there. Um, then for a while there, they had kind of, you know, Got to the point where they were like, "Oh well, we'll just we'll just de we'll just cut both battery cables," <clears throat> um, and that kind of work. Um, but I think one of the things that they they recommend now is when you cut a battery cable, you cut a chunk out of it, so there's no risk, there's no possibility of it actually accidentally coming back into contact. So if you cut a chunk out of that battery cable, um, the the likelihood of it actually being able to short circuit and be "Quote unquote," re reattached, re-energized is is much slimmer. <clears throat> so, treat all non-deployed airbags as if they are alive, <clears throat> and follow the proper disconnection. That you're going to have to get specialty training on. Uh, distancing is the best way to produce your uh, or reduce your chance of personal injury, soft tissues injuries to the upper extremities, the face, the head, fractures of the nose are the most common things that we hear of. Um, occasionally, uh, people complain of a little irritation from the talcum powder. Those uh, airbags are packed with talcum powder to keep them from sticking together. Um, so they deploy nice and easily. Um, and it's more of an irritant than anything. Um, that's a, a kind of a, a common complaint as well. <coughs> airbags have come a long ways. Um, in fact, um, one of our vehicles that, that we currently have um, Personally, uh, we have you know driver and, and passenger side airbags uh, that come from either the steering wheel or the dash. We have them that drop down from above the windows. Uh, we have a curtain airbag that comes down in front of the windshield. In fact, we have a couple of curtain airbags that pop up between the front seats and one that pops up between the front seat and the back seat. Some that come out of the sides of the seat. So there's there's so many different types of airbags out there. Uh, that's why it's just as important for extrication and, and fire suppression personnel to have a continuing education and a continuous training regimen. Fuel leaks, <clears throat> fuel cylinders are usually in the area um, of the trunk of a passenger car or the bed of a pickup. It's not always. Um, fire personnel need to be used for potential fire suppression activity. <coughs> um, most departments, if they're going to roll out an extrication, they will pull a hose line. They'll have a hose line charged up just in case a fire breaks out. They can hopefully get it put out 
quickly. Animals. Occasionally we have wounded or scared animals, whether they were originally part of the scene or not. Um, maybe we have, have a, a, a dog that's in the car when the, dog, when the car crashes. That, that dog is going to be so confused as to what the heck's going on. Maybe it's even a service animal. And if it's a service animal, we have an added risk um, because they may misconstrue what we're doing and assume that we're trying to uh, injure um, their owner. Ice, water, darkness, of course, is a big deal. <coughs> That's why we have floodlights on our ambulances and fire trucks. Uh, down power lines, damaged poles, down trees. Um, I, I had a summer in which I was working, uh, in which it just seemed to be the summer that everybody happened to get trapped underneath a tree they were trying to cut down. I mean, it almost got to the point of being ridiculous. I think I had three in a very short period of time where people were cutting down trees and were either killed or uh, severely injured by the falling tree. Traffic. Traffic is probably our biggest risk that we face on a regular basis um, because people aren't paying attention. We've got the looky-loos. That's why it's important that we stage vehicles appropriately. We use appropriate lighting for the situation. Turn off any white light that you have in your emergency lights. So the white light that's on the front of your ambulance, if you have flashing headlights, turn those off. Um, those blind people. So the white light should be directed at the scene it shouldn't be flashing. It shouldn't be. <coughs> um, it shouldn't be distracting. <clears throat> loaded bumpers. Occasionally, we have spring-loaded bumpers in which, if we're trying to approach a car and, and do an extrication, um, uh, the spring-loaded bumper can actually kind of give give way or actually push back, uh, and uh, with some pretty significant force. Hazmat. We can have hazmats in, in small vehicles. People can, can be transmitting or transporting hazardous materials in their private autos, and you would not necessarily know because unless they have a certain amount of it, they don't have to have placards indicating um, that it's even present. So, or maybe we have uh, a situation in which we are in an agricultural setting. Always the potential for hazmat there. Fluid leaks, gas, uh, we already mentioned gas leaks. Um, hot fluids such as radiators. Uh, debris, glass. So here they're showing using a, a step chalk or a cribbing uh, in order to stabilize uh, this vehicle. Uh, it's certainly something to keep in mind for the simple fact that um, this crash has perhaps uh, caused an issue with the transmission or with the brakes. Um, even though the vehicle may be turned off, <coughs> there's the potential for it to move, for it to roll. Cribbing fills voids, and it prevents from movement. Shoring is used when cribbing cannot uh, be accomplished uh, in a practical way. So that's when they may build up some additional things there. And then rigging can be used for further stabilization. So they may also use things such as um, cables and uh, straps in order to uh, try to uh, give further stabilization to keep it from, from moving, particularly we see rigging and shoring, particularly when we have vehicles that aren't on all fours. Hybrid vehicles um, know the location and construction of the battery compartments. They have much, much larger batteries. They have much more intricate uh, electrical settings and electrical systems. <laughs> and so frequent uh, updates in uh, learning about hybrid vehicles. And most of the vehicle companies are pretty good at trying to get this information out. So. Turn off uh, the ignition, remove the key, disconnect the 12 volt battery system, um, much like we would with, with any other vehicle. Uh, enclosed hybrid vehicle batteries usually are in metal cases and located near, under, or behind the rear seats. So you may not have real big batteries uh, up in the under the hood uh, in your hybrid vehicles. Most of the time these are s significantly larger battery systems. And so uh, they need a bigger compartment. <clears throat> um, some of these can remain powered up for up to 10 minutes after the vehicle is shut off. Avoid touching, cutting, breaching their power cables. Those cables are typically bright orange. Another thing that you typically will find is a bright colored, typically orange, 
um, are control boxes and cables that have to do with airbags. So if it is bright colored, uh, intending to get your attention, uh, it's probably a good thing not to be cutting on or spreading near uh, for the very good possibility <coughs> that it's going to have a negative outcome. Let's try to identify your vehicle as hybrid, stabilize it, access the patient passenger compartment, make sure that the vehicle is in park. I think that one gets overlooked uh, from time to time. Uh, engage any, uh, if you can, engage a uh, parking brake. <coughs> and then check the dash for any indication of power. All right, so top impact uh, extrication, uh, top uh, presenting part may or may not be the roof. Sometimes it's we have vehicles that have rolled over and are rolled onto their side, rolled onto their tops. Um, difficulties gaining access into the patient compartment uh, are related how the vehicle came to rest. Vehicles coming to rest on all four are going to be the easiest vehicles for us to access. Just a simple fact. So, bottom impact where we have wreckage <clears throat> on the floor of the underside of the vehicle, be wary of what may be beneath the vehicle. So things that may have popped out. Side impact, it's the least protected area. You use a high index of suspicion for uh, significant trauma. Frontal impact, we can't, we'll have those engine related hazards potential for fire. Um, the first rising pumper should hopefully apply some uh, safety precautions. Uh, I mentioned that engine cradles dropping out occasionally or most new, new vehicles are now set so that if a vehicle has a significant front end impact uh, that the engine cradle actually drops out of the bottom of the car. So uh, as opposed to older vehicles in which the engine a lot of times came through the firewall and landed on the patient's lap. So. Rear impact, typically that's where the fuel tanks are. Um, interior, dashboards, steering wheels, seats, pedals may need to be removed. Uh, pedals are terrible. I've had many, many patients who had legs and feet tangled up in, in pedals that we had to cut or <coughs> spread or remove in order to simply get them out. And that was one of the very few things that had them pinned in the vehicle. Um, but sometimes the dashboard actually comes down on the patient's lap as well. So, um, ongoing assessment, monitoring during extrication is important, particularly as we have things that can require complicated extrication. So those sorts of things we have to consider um, whether or not uh, we, we're going to have a, a potential change or uh, in that patient's condi uh, condition as we move something or as we spread something away. So continuing to look at the basic ABCs, final mobilization. Extrication tools, you probably are not, uh, if you are strictly in an EMS setting, you probably are not going to have to do this. Um, and if you uh, do, again, you'll be needing to, uh, to get additional education uh, in using these extrication tools. <coughs> um, extricating patients uh, can often be successful with basic hand tools uh, and never require complex or expensive power tools. Sometimes it's just a matter of moving something a little bit. Uh, it doesn't always require big things. You may have something, you know, use of a window punch here. Window punches uh, are in, uh, in most of today's glass that is used in uh, vehicles. It's, it's intended to uh, um, shatter in a safer manner. Now if we're talking things like a windshield where we have a laminated uh, glass, um, it's going to, to shatter, but it's all going to stay there because it's basically covered in scotch tape on both sides. And uh, it, it shouldn't all just fall into onto the patient. Side windows, however, don't usually have that lamination. So to pop a side window, a lot of times you get the, the break, and this is a side window, so I'm not sure if they put something on it or what, but um, to get a, a break, a lot of times you end up with glass that all falls in. So I do know of some situations in which um, uh, systems are, are using like getting rolls of contact paper and they'll like take this roll of contact paper, they'll real quickly put a, this film of contact paper on one side of the window, usually the inside of the window, pop it with the, the, uh, the center punch there and then basically they've captured 
all of those shards of glass and it's all stuck on this one sheet of contact paper easily to move away. Here they're using a hydraulic spreader um, and it's just as it sounds. It's intended to spread uh, heavy metal apart. This is using a hydraulic ram and uh, and as uh, hydraulic rams are used to, I don't think this is actually a hydraulic ram though. They identified it as a hydraulic ram. I think this is actually just a shoring ram or a shoring um, post. But anyway, uh, I don't see the hydraulic component to it, so that's what is kind of confusing me here. But a hydraulic ram would basically be like a shock absorber um, that as you apply the hydraulics to it, it gets longer, 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 and it works basically like a spreader as well. Um, we have a variety of different extrication tools uh, that we may be uh, called upon to use. A lot of hand tools, simple things like screwdrivers and pliers and hammers, chisels, whatnot. Um, I have some striking tools, so various hammers and rams uh, and picks and punches and cutters. Um, I mentioned uh, one that uh, we used to use that um, basically was a slide hammer and a big giant uh, uh, can opener that would cut some of this uh, sheet metal. Prying tools, crowbars are fairly common, halogen bars, um, cutting tools, so we may be talking things that are simple like hacksaws, and we may be talking about something a little, uh, you know, uh, power tools, power saws and whatnot. Hydraulic tools, what often are referred to as the, the jaws of life, is usually the hydraulic spreaders and cutters. We have manual hydraulic tools. These are the old porta power systems that we used to use. Uh, the porta powers were basically you pumped it much like an old uh, water pump handle um, that uh, you would pump it and uh, it applied hydraulic pressures uh, in order to do some spreadings. So power driven hydraulics. <coughs> um, talked about things such as the spreaders, the shears, the pedal cutters, extension rams. Um, and then sometimes those aren't actually um, generator powered. There's even a nice, nice, nicer sets out now that are battery powered um, that are not nearly as, as loud um, but still have pretty uh, impressive power to them. So pneumatic lifting tools, so things like airbags where they'll actually slide this bag underneath something, hook up a, a firefighter's uh, air tank bottle, uh, inflate this airbag, and it actually lifts things up. And they can use multiple layers of these to help uh, lift things. <coughs> All right. So in summary, we're going to be begin performing a patient care um, upon our initial contact unless the scene is unsafe. During extrication, patient care continues to be our concern. In some instances, extrication will need to supersede patient care because we simply can't get to them. Um, treat the patient to the level that is safe for you, the patient, and the extrication crew. PPE is paramount. Provide the patient with protection as well. Don't forget about them. It's not just us. Um, removal of the patient can be the very difficult part of extrication. Sometimes it's, um, a, a, it's almost a puzzle. <clears throat> Uh, determine what means of egress you should use and the best method of packaging. And that's going to be determined by your patient's condition. Remember, try to remove the patient via their long axis of their body. Don't try to move them sideways. Try to move them upward and downward. Um, employ commercial devices for full spinal immobilization. As disentanglement occurs, continue to provide soft tissue, musculoskeletal uh, issues. So. Maybe it started out we were doing fine and now all of a sudden we freed up the patient's arm and they're hemorrhaging and hemorrhaging and hemorrhaging. And so it's something we definitely have to kind of keep in mind. Um, we may need to bump up what we're doing uh, in a particular situation simply for the fact that uh, so much has changed uh, from where we originally started with the patient. <clears throat> Be prepared for issues related to hypovolemia. This is very common actually when people are entrapped. Um, keep informed about safe and effective means of extrication. Work together with extrication departments so you guys can all be on the same sheet of music. 
and extrication process is typically performed by a designated rescue team and as an AEMT. Um, understand and in certain instances direct the extrication of patients from motor vehicles. Um, and again, it's very, very dependent on the type of system you work in. 